agile applied to free software contributions. So the idea is not to have a, an agile course here uh, because I'm no expert. Uh, I use agile, but uh, I don't know much about it. What I do know, what I do try to understand is that agile differs according to the people you talk to and everybody applies it in various ways. Uh, sometimes it's for uh, an excuse to rip off a client, uh, but we're developers and we don't do that. So what I find useful is to try to think about the Agile manifesto uh, and go over it uh, when thinking about uh, free software projects. So the first slide, which you don't have, uh, the first slide is about the first six principles of Agile. The customer satisfaction by rapid delivery of useful software. The idea is there, the key is that we try to deliver as fast as possible. In the case of Ceph, uh, the pace is every two weeks there is a development release. And then every two months there is a stable release, which is fairly fast. And as contributors, we can try to aim at providing a patch that we believe to be working almost every day, uh, at least once a week. And then we don't say, uh, okay, we, we will be uh, fixed on something and then never change our mind. Welcome changing requirements even late in development. The, uh, even the idea that it's late in development is bizarre because when we make free software, and that's what we see with Ceph, there is never an end. It's uh, an ongoing process. So we are always late and early in the development. Whenever we act, we change things. So this very much applies to free software, which is more a flux than a product. So working software is delivered frequently, weeks rather than months, so we're completely in that. And working software is the principal measure of progress. In the case of free software, it's kind of obvious, but uh, when we deal with our managers, it's often seen as progress, for instance, to uh, provide slides about the state of the art of something which is not uh, agile in the sense that it does not provide software. Provide thinking, maybe an insight, it does not mean it's not useful. It's only, it's not progress. And whenever it comes to contribution, ultimately uh, you will be judged on the patch you produce and the fact that they are, they are accepted upstream. So, uh, and then we must uh, sustainable development able to maintain a constant pace. Uh, as a contributor, when, uh, when we are um, entering a project, uh, it's often tempting to uh, work very hard to gain the respect of the upstream to the point that we may burn out. And this fifth principle of Agile is precisely to prevent that. If we want to last in a project, which is in Ceph, that's my goal, yeah, that's your goal, we want to be there for the months to come, we must go slow and make sure that we can sustain this space uh, for a long time. And then we must not lose track of the business people. That is or the clients. As a developer, uh, sometime I feel that I like something so much that I could spend a week or even a month within this piece of code, completely forgetting the outside world. And it would fit very good. But that's not the goal of a software. A software is meant to be used by people, not to be developed by developers and never used by anyone. So. I, I need to force myself to reach out to the world 
and check that what I'm doing is actually useful. So in the case of erasure coding, for instance, on a regular basis, I discuss the need for erasure coding with my managers in the company. Or uh, on the mailing list, I discuss erasure coding with people who think they, they would need it. And so I get a sense of how they would use it. And ultimately, uh, they will be the user. So I have two kinds of business people, the business people in my company and the business people I don't really know on the mailing list who uh, plan to use the Ceph uh, erasure coding. Then there is this point which I don't agree uh, about. Face-to-face -face conversation is the best form of communication. Of course, we when we get to talk face-to-face, -face, something happens, and that never happens when we chat online. So this is good. But it's written uh, in the Agile Manifesto as if it was always the best form of communication, where I've seen far too often uh, that uh, in a company you have these uh, constant meetings where people talk and nothing progresses. So sometimes it's better to uh, communicate in writing or uh, uh, over the phone during a few minutes rather than organizing a meeting. So I disagree with the face-to-face -face conversation is the best form. Uh, it's sometimes the best form. Then the trust is essential uh, to build something that actually works and it can break things when you distrust uh, distrust your uh, developers your co-developers or even the manager uh, when it comes to a free software project ultimately it boils down to uh, do you as a contributor uh, have respect for the upstream it can be really difficult when when you don't when you think that okay they have this software that is very well known but uh, they are really crappy developer and I'm better than them and that happens sometimes when you, you run into a project and uh, you, you think you're better than the upstream you need to find a way to trust the upstream and one of the best way I found is to think about what it took for the upstream to sustain in the long run this project so it, it may it may be code that you would have written differently but if the upstream had this code well known widely distributed during years it has to uh, to be something it, it has to come for something and when you think about positive things about the upstream it helps you uh, forgive what you would have done differently. So for instance, in Ceph, uh, I'm sometimes de depressed by the fact that there are not as many tests as I would like. Because years ago, I discovered that having uh, a lot of tests, a lot of unit tests, actually never trying anything manually uh, helps a lot to stabilize, to prevent regressions, and so on. And I acknowledge that it's not something that is as important in the Ceph project to the core developers. I would like it to be different. But then, uh, instead of uh, not respecting the Ceph developers because they don't uh, do enough tests, uh, in, my, in my view, I, uh, I take a look at how smart they have been in inventing something that is entirely new. It takes a lot of imagination and efforts and so on. So, and that's just one example, but it's a way to build trust and to, to respect people. Um, the continuous attention to technical excellent, excellence and good design does not mean that we do things perfectly, but uh, I interpret this principle as we always try to do things better. So coming back to the test example, uh, when I first contributed to Ceph, uh, I saw that there was uh, an expertise and a design that is excellent, but tests could be improved. 
So I paid attention to test, which is uh, a factor of technical excellence in my view, and I pushed in this direction. And what I see in Ceph, for instance, is a constant uh, attention to improve the state of things. We're constantly fighting against technical debt, uh, things we do we should have done otherwise and then we have to repair them. Uh, what would be really bad if, is if we give up on that. And then uh, the simplicity is, uh, this principle uh, is actually my favorite and the most difficult. And it's written in a way that is bizarre because it says the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. That is the way I understand it is if you can do something, if you can achieve a goal in two ways and one of them uh, requires less work, that is, y you don't do as much, then you should choose the one that maximizes the work not done. So if you're trying to fix a bug and there is also some cosmetic change to be done, then you don't do the cosmetic changes. You stick to exactly the simplest thing that you should do. This is the one I like best because it's the one I have most trouble with. I tend to over-engineer, so I have to fight for that all the time. Uh, the 11th, uh, 11th um, principle actually never happens. I've never seen that happen. In Agile, you have a team and someone is responsible for organizing uh, the team that is the Scrum Master. And ideally, uh, the Scrum Master uh, is a role that is distributed among the team members. And let's say every month, uh, the Scrum Master changes and becomes a team member. That actually, uh, never happens but is a precondition for self-organizing teams. This role tends to stick on one person. I was, uh, I have tried to make that happen in teams uh, I participated in uh, and after a while seeing that it didn't work I reached out to uh, a friend who uh, is an Agile trainer and asked how should I do that? that never happens. And he says, well, that's a goal, but uh, I've only seen it happen twice, although he has been training agile uh, teams for a decade now. So I don't feel too bad if that doesn't happen. And uh, then we should, uh, the last principle is to adapt to changing circumstances. I don't understand that as small circumstances, but major changes. So when you see something happens that will significantly uh, change the context in which you're uh, acting, then you should just uh, change completely maybe your course of action, maybe completely your contribution process. So when we apply Agile, uh, it's always uh, the idea is that you take all these principles and you apply them as I just did to free software but you apply them to your context and it's your understanding and if someone else has another understanding so it's good but does not mean yours is wrong so for um, the free software project we have to find who is the product owner who is the scrum master who is the team member uh, when they are not declared in the case of Ceph uh, the product owner actually uh, is someone I think uh, it is Neil Levin and I don't know if you ever talked to him or yeah, but we, we don't see him so in in this project he is an employee of Ink Tank and he kinds of own the roadmap uh, but as a contributor you don't get to meet him yet you know it he exists and the reason he exists is because Ink Tank is organized with agile methods. And probably if you look at tracker.seth.com, you will see that he shows uh, that he does things. Uh, I didn't actually try to do that. 
and then the scrum master uh, depends on the sub project so uh, in the core project uh, in which I participate because uh, erasure coding is part of the core of Ceph um, I would say although I didn't ask again it's my guess that Sam is the scrum master because he is leading the daily meetings uh, in the case of the Rattles Gateway I suppose Yehuda is a scrum master because he is the lead but maybe he is not because being the lead does not mean you organize the, the method and then we as contributors we are team members of course but other core developers are also team members in the case of Ink Tank, because they use Agile, we can map that one-to-one. -one. We can actually find that. In the case of other projects, such as OpenStack, uh, they don't uh, actually apply Agile. So you have to guess who is in between roles. Say, oh, he does partly what a Scrum Master would do. So for instance, Thierry Carrez uh, is organizing a lot of things cross projects. So he he has the responsibility of uh, Scrum Master somehow. So these roles are hidden, uh, but you can discover them. When you are uh, using Agile, you must have, in, uh, you must be very conscious about the fact that you work for a client, for a customer, and you have to figure out who he is. So in the case of uh, an individual, there is no customer. It's your self-satisfaction. But it's very rare that a project is only for one individual. Now in the case of a company, for instance, uh, uh, the company who pays uh, my salary, uh, the customer is someone in my company. Because uh, the goal of the company is to operate a public cloud. So the Ceph will be used by people who deploy it in order to provide a service to clients. So there is a two steps uh, process where the user will not actually use Ceph nor erasure coding. The people who are the clients uh, will actually use what I'm doing is a division in my company. So I try to identify that and I know that I must be very aware of what they want, and they must be aware of what I do. But now Ceph is a free software project also, so when I'm in the context of contributing to Ceph, I also must be very aware of who will be using ultimately this erasure coding uh, part. And these are the customers of the Ceph project. And if there is no overlap between the two, if my company wants something with a racial coding that is completely different from what the Ceph users from the free software world want, then maybe I'm in the wrong project. Maybe I should use something else because if there is no overlap, uh, I will run into problems. Uh, I mean, my company will go in a direction, the Ceph user will go in another direction. So I, I as a team member, I have to keep an eye on that and nobody else will because my company does not care much about the Ceph uh, users. They have their agenda, they must make money, they have a business to run. They, they, they shouldn't care about the Ceph community clients and the Ceph uh, community users client, they don't care about the agenda of my company. So in the end, I'm alone trying to do this reconciliation and every contributor is in this situation the company product owner he has a certain amount of responsibility and he's the voice of the client so when in the company usually when they apply um, agile methods there is someone appointed to do that which makes the life of the developer that is myself for instance uh, much easier because instead of trying to decode what the client really wants because he does not know exactly how to translate his needs into technical terms, the product owner will actually understand that need, which is rather abstract, 
or could be abstract like something uh, I would like to have cheaper storage the client could just say that and the product owner would say okay uh, we have to find ways to reduce the hardware used by the replica in Ceph which is much more specific uh, so in the company we, we have uh, that product owner and in the case of the upstream project we identify also the product owner so when uh, again uh, about Ceph uh, during the there is a space in time where we can uh, find the product owner that is the Ceph uh, summit the first edition of which was uh, in April and during this time we don't actually talk to one person but we present uh, solutions and the product owner is present during this Ceph summit and can express also the needs of the clients in ways that could be better understood by us contributors. And that's somehow what happened uh, regarding erasure coding. That is, not only there was the user, uh, but also it felt right for me as a contributor to jump in because I felt that the product owner within Intac uh, was in line with uh, implementing erasure coding. And the reason why I knew that is because beforehand I identified Neil as being the product owner and we had a few short chats about uh, erasure coding and the, the fact that some people find that uh, three replicates is too much. So I, I heard the client, I knew a bit about the product owner, and as a contributor, I figured that that would fit. The uh, contributor and the mentor uh, have roles during this upstream university uh, training. That is, the mentor will act as a scrum master. Thing is, it might not be the case for Ceph. For instance, in your in your case, uh, you want to contribute to Rados Gateway. There is a scrum master. So maybe uh, the mentor uh, during the online sessions will not have to play the scrum master. Maybe we will find the scrum master, and you will be under his wing. Uh, one of his responsibilities in the company is to shield you from outside interferences to make sure you are fed with uh, tasks that are achievable match your skills so that you can maximize your efficiency that would be the task of the mentor uh, if the project is not equipped with a scrum master but if we find in the case of Ceph the scrum master that can play this role for you uh, as a contributor to Rados Gateway that would make it a lot easier. Within the company, you're supposed to have the same kind of Scrum Master. And because they are both from uh, different environments, they want different things. And it might be difficult to reconcile the two. It's kind of the same as the clients. The clients are very different, but they have very abstract needs and your task in trying to reconcile uh, what they want is uh, could be uh, can be easy that is for instance in uh, Rados Gateway geo replication it's fairly obvious that a lot of people want that and if you ask your management uh, do you want geo replication because uh, you explain that it will allow recovery in case of a data center going down uh, they can easily say yes and you can easily see from the Ceph community that people are also outside of your company hungry for that. Now when, in, when it comes to the Scrum Master, the Scrum Master is much more specific in what he organizes. So you have to find tasks 
that are meaningful in the context of the company and in the context of the upstream project. It's fairly easy when you have a long-term goal, so you are in a, in a good spot. Because then you can just say, okay, I, uh, I decide that I will work on this under the wing of uh, the Ceph Scrum Master. You can say that to your in-house Scrum Master because it serves the long-term goal. It does not mean anything for the company, but I'm doing something that is long-term. It would be very different if you had a bug to fix where there would be conflicts such as for instance the upstream requires that the fix is done in addition there must be a test that demonstrate that the fix is actually done in a context where there are no tests so it will take you a week to create the context for tests but the upstream insists in doing that while your scrum master in the company says we must go uh, we must put this fix in production right now it's critical so uh, I don't want the test right now don't waste your time on test just fix the bug and then work on the test later so there you will have a, a harder time trying to reconcile the two the company team member has uh, responsibility that is different from the upstream team member. In the company, he is the specialist in a relevant discipline, decides what will be done in one sprint, estimates how big each task is, participates in all daily meetings, and does things. So you have a uh, responsibility that is clearly defined, and you must develop skills to figure out how long uh, it will take you to do something and you have to make a promise to the Scrum Master that you will hold. When you are facing upstream as a contributor, you, in addition to all that, you must also uh, be a model team member, especially if you're new, as we, we said this morning, uh, you must be better than the others because you have to prove yourself. But in the case of a uh, free software project that is not organized with agile methods, you also have to help the Scrum Master who does not know that he is a Scrum Master in your mind. Because you know that you will, for instance, you will need the Scrum Master in the free software project to shield you from uh, outside interferences, for instance, dispute between leads in the project. So if you find someone that is able to do that, then you will have to uh, ask him to step in in case things go wrong and there is a flame war and so on. So you cannot just forget about the role of the Scrum Master. You have to identify the role of the Scrum Master which may be spread among many individuals and then rely on them explicitly. And it's the same for the product owner. Sometimes you have to push the project lead to be a good product owner uh, because he wouldn't say exactly what his understanding of the client needs are. And so you as a team member, you don't know exactly what technically you're supposed to do because you don't quite understand the view of the lead of the project. So as a, an upstream team member, you have a responsibility that is heavier than as the company team member. Then you have this product backlog, um, and I will go over that uh, fairly quickly because uh, it's more about learning um, the actual uh, agile process. What I have to say, in the context of Upstream University, the reason why we use Agile is because it allows us to see the online mentoring sessions as if they were daily meetings. So in a usual uh, sprint iteration, you do, let's say, one week, you make a daily meeting, 15 minutes, with, uh, with the Scrum Master. 
in the case of upstream university, we may not have uh, time to work full time. So say you have eight hours of work uh, done within one week, then we, would, we will pretend that it is just one day and we will make a daily meeting as if only one day passed. So as soon as you have eight hours of work done, we will decide that it's uh, a day and we will make a daily meeting. We will actually only do one sprint. That is, uh, at the end of this sprint, your contribution, whatever it is, uh, will be upstream and we will say, we will call that a sprint. We only have one goal when it's done the training is, got, is done. Uh, here I go over what the product backlog is, which may be difficult to, uh, to understand uh, sometimes. Uh, there are a number of bugs uh, that can be picked uh, and also feature requests, wh which are uh, difficult to understand most of the time and one of the work uh, you could pick is to uh, help the feature request become clearer or by asking questions to the, the person who submitted these feature requests and then where possible uh, during the online mentoring we will uh, be conscious of what the upstream sprints are so it's fairly easy, uh, version uh, 065 was published today, yesterday, so we are at the beginning of a sprint, uh, probably as, uh, as of Monday, it's probably that. So we, we know that patches are more likely to be accepted now, uh, because there is time, there are, there are two weeks uh, to fix whatever problems uh, arise. So uh, we are lucky in Ceph because the sprints are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, we will also uh, try to work on the upstream and company uh, reconciliation. So we, we've not talked about that, but uh, for every student, we spend some time, uh, so tomorrow, uh, trying to figure out uh, what is the upstream goal, what is the company goal, and what needs to be reconciled. It's something that you intuitively know, uh, but if we discuss it, it will make that more obvious, um, and it will also show where you should uh, emphasize your effort. Um, and then it's not useful. Yeah. Because I already did that. Yeah. Je devrais. Um, okay. Je devrais supprimer ces derniers slides. Hop. Uh, uh, stop, stop, stop. De toute façon, je vais devoir l'éditer.